Our live streaming has begun. Good afternoon and welcome to our Bloom Energy Empowered Communities Employee Town Hall. I have a great pleasure today of moderating an in-depth and substantive, but also fun conversation with our Chief Marketing Officer and Executive Vice President, Cheryl and Moore, and the First Lady of the Garden State, the state of New Jersey, Tammy Murphy. First Lady Murphy, Cheryl and Moore, welcome and thank you for participating today. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. As a reminder to our Bloom Energy colleagues who continue to populate our virtual room for our employee town halls today, our Bloom Energy Empowered Communities employee town halls are broken into three segments to make them as interactive as possible. Mm -hmm. The first is I have the distinct pleasure of asking four or five questions to two amazing leaders. Second is what we lovingly call our lightning round, seven or eight quick questions with one word to one sentence responses and no run on sentences. And then finally, my favorite part is our interactive session with our Bloom Energy employee colleagues to place in the chat box their questions and we will get to as many of your questions as possible. With that, let me introduce our Bloom Energy colleague who worked so hard in putting today's employee town hall together from our government relations and community team, Manal Shafi. Manal, would you do the pleasure of introducing our special guest? Thank you, Carl. And it is my pleasure to introduce First Lady Tammy Murphy, who has been serving the state of New Jersey since 2018. Prior to her involvement in politics, she attended the University of Virginia, where she majored in communications and English, and then went on to become a banker at Goldman Sachs. While her husband served as an ambassador, she and her family represented the United States in the Federal Republic of Germany from 2009 to 2013. Upon returning to New Jersey, she and her husband founded a think tank to jumpstart New Jersey's economy. Over the years, the First Lady has worked with nonprofits, a think tank, and other organizations focused on the environment, education, healthcare, youth and family services, as well as the arts and transatlantic relations. In 2019, she launched the Nurture New Jersey Strategic Plan, which is a multi-pronged, multi-agency initiative that aims to make New Jersey a safer and more equitable place to deliver and raise a baby. She also currently serves as secretary and charter member of the Climate Reality Action Fund, an organization founded by former Vice President Al Gore. And without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to First Lady of New Jersey, Tammy Murphy. And all Shafi, thank you. First Lady Tammy Murphy and our Executive Vice President, Chief Marketing Officer, Cheryl and Moore, thank you both for joining us today. And it's such a pleasure to start with our first question in segment one. Cheryl and Moore and First Lady Murphy, you are both highly accomplished professionals. At any point in your career, did you face any obstacles as a woman in the workplace? And if so, how were you able to address or overcome these obstacles? Cheryl and Moore, if you don't mind, we'll start with you and then First Lady Murphy. Thank you, Carl. Uh, what a pleasure to be here and what a pleasure to be here with you, uh, First Lady Tammy. Uh, lovely to meet you. Uh, you know, I look at, you know, obstacles that I faced and, and, and a story or a moment in my life comes to mind. I was uh, a young leader that was put on a management track. I, I was still in my late 20s. I'd made the decision that it was a good time to put braces on, and I was given a really large uh, management team of mostly men uh, to manage that were all older. And I remember one of my biggest obstacles was having confidence in myself and it, what was a fairly intimidating situation at time and uh, at times. And Often, you know, later in my career, I was also given opportunities where I went from being a peer in a team, in a somewhat smaller team, and then being put over that team, I, again, of, of usually majority 
definitely a majority of men. And, and I remember those obstacles. And I don't know if I feel they were obstacles as much of what externally came to me as it was my having to face those things head on and, and figure out how to, to do a really good job in a situation that could be intimidating. And I, I, I really did rely on strong leaders uh, a lot of good books <laughs> and, and coaching along the way. And uh, what does not kill us makes us stronger. So um, th those are some of the memories I, I have in my mind. And, and I'm sure like many of us, we've made every mistake in the book. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Sherilyn, thank you. Good leaders, good books, good mentors along the way. Thank you very much. First Lady Tammy Murphy, the same question to you. Uh, absolutely. You know, before I answer that question, I just want to thank you, Carl, for uh, for reaching out to me and, and staying in touch. Um, we, we, we met only recently, but it's been it's been really rewarding for me already. And uh, hello to all of you at Bloom Energy um, and Sherilyn. It's, it's fabulous to be here with you as well. Um, I guess what I would say is a woman working in finance in the 80s and 90s. I absolutely faced obstacles. Um, so many women have experiences similar to mine where there are big challenges and blatant moments of discrimination, um, as well as the smaller daily experiences, which we now recognize, I guess, as microaggressions. Um, at the time, I often found myself trying to find ways to diffuse every uncomfortable situation and every kind of frat boyish joke um, beyond being the only woman in the room uh, I truly did not then have the agency to stop that behavior. Um, those experiences really stayed with me and, and I have been absolutely determined to be a part of the culture of change that ends um, misogyny. Um, I'm incredibly proud of my all female staff in the Jer New Jersey office of the first lady and even prouder of what we have been able to accomplish together. Um, but I also credit my husband for understanding that promoting women is just outright smart for business, um, given those businesses that have women in the C-suite are proven to be more creative and among other metrics, more successful over time. Uh, to that end, I am also proud that my husband has the first female majority cabinet in the 237 year history of the great state of New Jersey. Awesome. That is yeah. wonderful to hear. Thank you for <laughs> sharing a little bit about your background as well. Uh, incredibly impressive, both of you. First Lady Murphy, you have lived and worked in several countries and amazing cities such as London, Frankfurt, Hong Kong, and Berlin. Sherilyn, you represent our company internationally through overseeing Bloom's South Korea business and serving on Bloom Energy Korea's board of directors. What are a few of the insights you have gained from your cross-cultural professional experiences? And First Lady movie, uh, Murphy, we'll start with you, then Sherilyn. Um, great. Well, I, first of all, I have actually lived overseas for 16 years of my life. So uh, I've, I've seen a lot of different places and lived in many different places for sure. Um, I guess what I would say is I truly wish that every American had the opportunity to travel abroad. Um, being exposed to different countries, um, customs, languages, and cultures really opens up your worldview and can be life-changing. Um, but I guess there's probably two specific benefits that I wanna share. First, um, it, it really gets you out of your comfort zone and away from your kind of favorite brand of toothpaste, you know, your local grocery store, um, your native language, and basically everything you're accustomed to. Um, you, you witness hardships and challenges that really you probably don't find as often here in our country um, and which you probably might have taken for granted when you're at home. You know, the ease of travel. Um, you know, you don't have to show your passport every time you go for, to another state. You can travel thousands of miles. Um, the ease of communication, given we all speak English, basically. Um, safely drinking tap water. Um, there, there's no place in the world like the United States of America and that is the truth. And we should all be aware of just truly how blessed and fortunate we are to live here. Um, I'd say the second benefit is the opportunity to see the way other people live and to perhaps bring back a new idea um, or a vision that could improve the lives of others here. Um, travel really opens up your mind to new possibilities and helps you imagine what previously may have seemed impossible. 
Um, I guess the American dream is an incredibly special and unique ideal, but it is also pretty rigid. You know, in Germany, for example, beginning in grammar school, there's a strong emphasis placed on apprenticeships and a shared understanding that a university degree is not the only way forward in life. Um, we would probably do well to adopt that here. Um, and, and I know some have, but I think there's a general understanding that most people think they should go to college. And, you know, I think there's a greater value can be placed on things like the arts, um, environmental preservation, and, and so many other areas that, that we sometimes take for granted. That really resonates what you said. First, I'm not sure I could get over the not having my favorite toothpaste part <laughs> of living abroad for 16 years, but I'll get over that. But your comment about apprenticeships in countries like Germany, what a best practice for us. We, we currently have 207, 227 advanced manufacturing positions open in the state of Delaware for Bloom Energy that while we require a high school degree, doesn't even require a high school de degree to have a meaningful career with a future for your family. And we have 320 advanced manufacturing positions open here in Silicon Valley as well. So people don't always realize college does not have to be your track to have a great, meaningful, mission-driven career. Cheryl and Moore, would you mind sharing your experiences, cross-cultural, professional, and personal as you've traveled around the globe? Yeah, thank you, Carl. I, I've had the opportunity of traveling um, to every continent and all over the world in the last 20 years of my business career. And, you know, I really, you know, what, what, what you just said, Tammy, really resonated with me when you, when you bring up that you see things that we take for granted every day. Um, it is clean drinking water and the level of poverty that I've seen. I have a, just a very vivid image of being in Trinidad and Tobago and seeing how they live in, uh, you know, miles and miles of tarps where people do their best to get by and the, the, di the diff disconnect of the haves and the haves nots being so stark that it's even hard to get our mind around. And we, we really are so incredibly blessed as a nation. And I also resonate with everyone should have the opportunity to be able to go experience these different cultures. You, you not only build a sense of gratitude, but you also, you do build a, a deeper set of respect for different points of views and cultures and not being inflexible to our way or the highway. And it does open your mind to the possibilities and the creative thinking. Uh, on the business side, I, I would also say that one of the, the also really large takeaways is what isn't different. So when you go overseas and you're doing business, it is still, you know, the very fundamental principles that exist in any business. It's people work with people and people care about people, regardless of the culture, of the idiosyncrasies, the small differences and the differences in the toothpaste. You know, you still, you know, you still need to build trust and you still need to care about each other to do really good business. And uh, to me, the, you know, really recognizing the things that are also very common is really important as well. And while it's fascinating and interesting, you, you still come back to really basic principles of decency, respect and trust and walking in someone else's shoes as being foundational to making magic happen. And I've really held on to those principles and enjoy working in other cultures with that always in mind. And I would say um, most recently, um, spending more time in Korea than I'd ever had in my prior life, just in the last uh, year or two. What I love about Korea and I found is they love American culture. And I was fascinated when you can, you know, click through your television channels in your hotel room and you click on it and you're, you're convinced that it's, you know, Major League Baseball and really it's Korean baseball that looks identical, including where ads are placed along the back of the baseball fields. And then the next channel is uh, golf, which looks like a PGA tournament in the U.S., but it's in Korea. So the similarities of, you know, the, the way we also share cultures is also fascinating to me. So um, a, a lot, a, a lot there, but it's, uh, it makes life interesting. 
Cheryl and Moore, thank you. When, when my dad served in the Korean War, he came back with the same impression as well. That it's so much uh, mutual respect and admiration for the two cultures. And there is so much more that brings us together than should ever divide us. Uh, at Bloom Energy, we strive to address the causes and consequences of climate change through our energy platform. Uh, First Lady Tammy Murphy, as Secretary and Charter Member of the Climate Reality Action Fund, you mobilize Americans to take action to help solve our climate crisis. What inspired you both to make addressing climate change a central component of the work you do? And then Sherilyn, what motivates you to help lead a clean, resilient energy company to provide affordable energy to everyone on the planet? Uh, this time we're going to start with Sherilyn Moore. Okay, well, thank you, Carl. Um, I am deeply passionate uh, about climate and in particular energy where I've had the luxury of spending so many years, the last 20 years being involved in and seeing the possibilities and the potential as well as the pitfalls. Um, the moment that I think really stands out to me when um, it became life's work or a real passion beyond my career and just knowing it's the right thing to do was the opportunity I had um, almost six years ago to go to Antarctica on a, on a journey. Uh, it was a, a voyage uh, headed up by uh, uh, Sir Robert Swan called Journey 2041. And essentially, Antarctica is pr protected by an international treaty that expires in 2041. And that treaty is protecting Antarctica from you know, commercial uh, utilization of its natural resources. And the number one threat of what is most valuable is there is gas and fossil fuels. Uh, that are in uh, Antarctica that could be tapped into. So he's made it his life mission to raise awareness about clean energy so that we, by 2041, have eliminated the level of dependence on uh, oil reserves and fossil fuels. And it is so enlightening to see the beauty of something so untouched by man and so well taken care of by an international treaty of who we might even think today as our biggest enemies, working together as scientists and, uh, and stewards of that great continent working together. So that was inspiring to me. Um, I'm a very big pragmatist and let's take the action from where we are today and work together while also having an eye on a bold future. And that's why joining Bloom was a no brainer for me. We, we have a flexible platform that provides critical energy and resiliency today, but we have paths and views of how we can get to a zero carbon future uh, tomorrow at a affordable uh, cost to provide clean, resilient energy for everyone in the world. And that just grabbed me. So I think that is my personal story and, and has become my professional story as well. Cheryl and Moore, your trip to the Antarctic has certainly been to our benefit here at Bloom Energy. Thanks for sharing that story. Thank I had not heard that before. And if you've just joined us, you've joined our Bloom Energy Empowering Communities Employee Town Hall with our Chief Marketing Officer and Executive Vice President, Cheryl and Moore, and our special guest, the First Lady of the State of New Jersey, Tammy Murphy. Tammy, we're going to come to you with that same question. What inspired you to make addressing climate change such a central component of the work you do. Uh, thank you, Carl. Um, certainly, you know, living in Germany in the early 90s was a very big influence. Um, that was where I first saw people bringing their own bags to the grocery store. Um, mm -hmm. I saw people separating bottles, uh, and, and it, it, which was a completely foreign concept to me. Um, I'm, I'm also glad to tell you that earlier this month, um, we started requiring New Jerseyans to bring their own bring their own bags to stores as well. So it, it, it took 28 years after I first observed that, but nonetheless, we did it. So um, I would also tell you, though, that having four children is a huge uh, motivating factor for me. Um, the evidence for climate change is is truly all around us. The weather is changing. You know, there's microbursts, there's flooding, there's wildfires. I need not tell you all that. Um, there, there's, you know, there's a giant floating island of trash between California and Hawaii. 
um, our, our landscapes, our, our withering species are declining and you know, uh, we have droughts and tornadoes and floods. Um, we have direct responsibility to the next generation to act drastically to save the planet. And you know, that, that, that next generation um, must understand and have the skill set to be able to cope with the challenges that sadly we are going to put on their backs, I fear. Uh, amazing. And thank you for taking something that you experienced in Germany and bringing it back to New Jersey. We are a big believer in bringing our own bags to the grocery store mm -hmm. as well, but it's the little items that add up to the big steps that we can take forward. Uh, I'm going to move on to our next question for our two special guests. This time we will start with the First Lady and then to Cheryl and Moore. Uh, for those of you who may not know, First Lady Tammy Murphy launched Nurture New Jersey in 2019 as a statewide initiative committed to ensuring equity in maternal and infant health outcomes for black and brown women and to reducing overall maternal and infant mortality and morbidity in New Jersey. On the topic of equity, First Lady Murphy, would you mind sharing the importance of equity in maternal and infant health care in New Jersey and in the United States as a whole? And after the First Lady responds, Sherilyn, what role does equity play in our mission here at Bloom Energy, especially in terms of reducing local air pollution? That's so disproportionately impacts some of our most underserved communities. Let's start with First Lady Murphy and Nurture New Jersey. Uh, absolutely. As Carl is well aware, I could, I could wax poetically on this topic for a good long while, so I will try and keep my remarks as brief as possible. Um, New Jersey is ranked 47th out of all 50 states for maternal deaths. The United States, despite our incredible healthcare system, is ranked 56th in the world for maternal deaths. These statistics alone are abysmal, but the racially disproportionate outcomes are, are even more disturbing. Um, a black mother in the state of New Jersey is over seven times more likely than a white mother to die of maternity-related complications. And a black baby is over three times more likely than a white baby to die before his or her first birthday. Um, those statistics really make it clear that our maternal and infant health crisis is in reality a black maternal and infant health crisis. And the truth is that the root cause of it is the institutional racism that has seeped its way into virtually every aspect of our society, all the way to our mothers and babies. Um, I'm proud to share that um, as Carl mentioned last year, we released the Nurture NJ um, maternal and infant health strategic plan, which is, which is what I consider to be our blueprint to make New Jersey the safest and most equitable state in the nation to deliver and raise a baby. Um, the plan is incredibly and necessarily broad in its scope, and we are working to truly transform the maternal health landscape from top to bottom. Um, I, I should also note that California um, also worked to address its maternal health crisis and we're very much, in, in, you know, we here were very much inspired by your important work. Um, in New Jersey, we are the first to focus on the equity in outcomes and ultimately we hope to serve as a model nationally. Uh, and I guess the last thing I would share is that, that our strategic plan had, has 70 actionable steps and we have already started or completed um, over half of those. And I really do think it's a great uh, blueprint for, for many other states around the country that want to want to try and fix this um, abysmal reality in the United States. That is such inspiring work that you're doing. Before we go to Cheryl and Moore, could you share just one of the many successes or how it's how it has touched an individual or family that you've come across in this work? Um, sure. I mean, there's so many pieces to kind of the nurture NJ puzzle. Um, we've done everything from, we started off having family festivals because um, it, it became pretty clear that there were, there were pockets, there's, there's areas obviously where there are hot spots and people suffer much more from either uh, preterm births or low birth weight babies or higher incidence of, of death um, or complications. So we took um, this thing called family festivals, which is, which is kind of half, uh, half job fair, half block party. Um, on the road, and we um, we went to 
some of these hotspot areas. And we brought together in one place, um, state, county, and local resources. And we set up all these tables around and, and, and had invited families. We worked through the, the, the local churches and synagogues to make sure we got the message out. We, we sent, we worked with the public school system with the mayor's office uh, to ensure that everyone knew we were coming. And we would typically bring, you know, like 150 different providers in one space at one time. And then as the families would come through, we give them uh, a card. If they went to X number of tables, they would they would qualify for a lottery ticket, which then they could win a, a baby seat or they could win, you know, cash that they could go to the grocery store or, or a grocery card. So we, we did this um, before the pandemic in, 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 in huge scale. We had uh, six of them and we managed to touch um, nearly 7,000 families in that time. And while I was really concerned about the fact that we were only there for a short period of time at one interval, it was so gratifying because what I saw was um, different providers would be swapping their business cards and you'd say, and they'd say, gosh, you know, I had a client last week who really could have used help with X and X could have been anything from housing to transportation to childcare to, you know, WIC services. I mean, it, it just ran the gamut. And so I think that, that as a result of all of these big family festivals we did pre pandemic and now the smaller, you know, now we do like 50 to hundred um, people at a time because we've had to keep the numbers down um, and we scheduled them that, that we've really created much more of a network of support across our state. And, and that's been, um, probably that's been one of the most gratifying things, but there's far too many, Carl. I could, I could really go on for a long time. Well, I'm, I'm glad you shared just a little bit and whet our appetite. What an inspiring and effective work. Uh, Sherilyn Moore, a similar question again to you, equity in outcomes, uh, especially in terms of the work we do at Bloom Energy around mm -hmm. reducing local air pollution. Yeah, thank you, Carl. I, I think to many outside of our energy bubble that we often reside in from a professional standpoint, people don't realize there are environmental inequities and they're on the rise. Uh, we've had more billion dollar extreme weather events in the US in the last two years than we'd had in the decade plus prior. And to what you were saying, First Lady Tammy Murphy is you know, these, these extreme weather issues are on the rise. And when we look at weather projections, they'd always been forecasted based on the past and history. And we now know that the history is not the prediction of our weather and our extreme weather of the future. So we don't even know what we're in for in the future. So as I'll get to environmental equity in a moment, um, most businesses rely on their power grid for their power as we would expect and we would know. And what do we think happens when they've had to prepare for the, the inevitability that they run out of power. Their only recourse really were diesel generating backup gen sets, diesel generators. And when you power on in one area, in an industrial area, uh, this many diesel gen sets, it's, it creates a massive air pollution problem. In one large city in the Southwest that I won't name, on the phone with their city leaders after a really large cold weather event, they said the amount of inequity of our, our population of people that live in these industrial areas where these generators are firing on is, actually, is, is absolutely harming our citizens. And again, it's disproportionate. The suburbs are not being impacted. Uh, so, you know, this notion of environmental equity is increasingly something that people don't really even realize is there. And there are solutions and, and, and clearly not to be a Bloom commercial, but this is exactly why you know, we're so passionate here for what we do and that we have alternatives and we do allow businesses to take charge of their energy where they're not dependent on diesel, which is some of the worst of the worst of the worst fuels that you can possibly use. And in Bloom, we don't burn fuels, there's no combustion. And there's no NOx, SOx, or, or harmful air particulates. So we, um, you know, we, we, we certainly have a powerful solution for the future and, and it gives us all something to be proud of and when we go forward from a professional standpoint. Uh, but there's always consequences. And I think we're just now starting to see the consequences of climate and extreme weather. And, and I couldn't agree more, it's, it's time to take action. 
Cheryl and Moore, thanks for articulating the challenge so effectively, but also the solutions like Bloom that eliminate, virtually eliminates localized air pollution and all the impacts on asthma and cancer and resp respiratory challenges like COVID uh, and so many more. I'm, I'm struck by, I think it was April of 2020 when Harvard came out with a study that one of every five deaths on the entire planet is directly attributable to air pollution. One of every five deaths. And the, as Sherilyn said, the disproportionate amount of that impact in our most underserved communities, both here in the United States, as well as abroad. My last question before we move on to our lightning round. In addition to being incredibly inspiring leaders, you are also both mothers. Uh, Tammy Murphy, you mentioned four children, Cheryl and Moore, two children. I have three, if I can ship them off to either of your homes, you let me know. <laughs> How has your role as a parent shaped your perspective on leadership as professionals, employers, and mentors to others? Sherilyn, we'll start with you. Well, first and foremost, um, you know, I, I have walked in the shoes of anything that my team, and in many cases, I, I, you know, I've seen. And I, I come from a leadership style of being incredibly flexible. Um, I do believe that you take care of your people and your understanding of the realities of people as people. Um, you know, the, the goodness, the loyalty, and the respect, and it's what we would all want. And so I, I definitely, being a mom, you know, allows you to see firsthand the, the stresses of early mornings and the, and the need to get home and the pickups and the drop-offs and even the complexity of the pickups and the drop-offs because you have to get them into car seats and you get, there's so, so much there. So I think an incredible amount of understanding that I bring um, as, a, as a leader into my organization of just, I, I understand and our families always come first. And I think um, for many of us, we love what we do and we're defined by our professional careers, but having leaders that understand that as well has, has been what I've been blessed by. And I hope I am able to provide that back to the people that I lead now as well. Um, you know, I think, I, I, you know, I think, I think more than anything, um, you know, being a mom in the workplace and having gone through all that, I've also really learned um, what balance really means and recognizing that you do choose career paths that can make a difference and have a purpose so that you not only bring home a paycheck, but you also set yourself up as a role model and example. So they have something to aspire themselves to. That keeps me going. Um, it would be a lot harder if I thought what I'm doing is just about putting a roof over their head or if it's just about, you know, being able to provide for them. It's like I also believe in what I'm doing and having purpose and passion um, is, is I really think I believe that and feel that because I'm a mom and because of my children and who I'm doing it for. So I think that's really shaped me. Um, and I have a lot of coworkers that aren't moms. Uh, they might be dads or they might have pets, but all of it is relative to the people we love and family can come in a lot of different ways. So, um, you know, I'm also very respectful of that as well. Carolyn, thank you for your purpose-driven work. First Lady Tammy Murphy, uh, share with us, parent, employer, mentor. <laughs> So I would just say everything that Sherilyn has just said is, is just ditto. So let me just start by saying that. Um, I think being a parent really brings your values into sharp focus. Um, certainly being a mother has influenced the policy issues I have taken on, um, maternal and infant mortality, climate change, um, women in business. Um, but it has also influenced the culture and tone that I hope I set in the office. Um, my team, uh, know it um, does not really matter with whom I am meeting. Um, and, and when I say that, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a scheduling meeting internally, an interview prep, um, a, a, or even I will tell you a private meeting with Angela Merkel. Uh, if one of my children calls me, I'm picking up the phone. Um, and rather than feeling um, that the demands of parenting are an interruption, um, I really view them as a huge benefit and an opportunity to make sure that our values are aligned in, in virtually everything we do. 
Um, and that is something that as my team begin to have families of their own, um, I hope that they take that with them. Um, I will tell you one funny, funny story, um, if I can really quickly, Carl, and that is uh, my, my husband and I both respond the same way. If our children are reaching out, we will drop anything we have that's going on. I was traveling out of state for out of state for a board meeting. Um, I don't know three three years ago. It was when Phil was first running the first time for governor, and he was in a room giving a speech to about 150 people, and his phone rang, and it was our youngest son. And Phil said to, he, the, the, he he recounted the story. He said, "So I thought, okay, I, I have to take it because Tammy's not around. She's in a board meeting, and he's obviously calling me." So Phil says to everybody, you know, excuse me, it's my son. I got to pick up. And he picks up. And sure enough, our youngest son, Sam, says, Dad, it's really bad. And, Sam, and Phil says, what is it? He said, RG3 is leaving the football team. Yeah. And I'm not quite sure what to do. And Phil <laughs> says, um, OK, really bad. I agree. Can, can we talk about this maybe a little bit later? So he, Phil said he got off the call and he looked he looked at the room and he thought, I could go one of two ways here. I can just say, yeah, I'm sorry. My son had an issue. I'm sorry I'd take that. But he went ahead and shared exactly what it was. <laughs> and laugh. So anyway. Oh, my goodness. And, and we have the same policy at our house. If one of our three children call, you got to pick up. Yeah, you, you never know it's going to be on the other line. Sherilyn, I, I, I bet it's the same way with you, with your two. Well, and I have to say, the other reason you have to pick up these days is they don't call anymore. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter Snapchats me, which I wouldn't even be on Snapchat if it wasn't that, and my, my son as well. So if they're calling, you pick up because there must be a real reason that they actually need to hear your voice. Absolutely. Thank you both for sharing that. Uh, we're going to move to segment two, again, our lightning round, and I will rotate back and forth so that nobody feels picked on. So we're going to start with Sherilyn Moore with our first lightning round question. Sherilyn, what book is currently on your nightstand? Well, I, I have two books. One, my mother-in-law just brought me her copy of uh, General Colin Powell's American Journey, and it's nice and faded, and I look forward to reading it for obvious reasons, and may, him, may he rest in peace as a great American leader. And my good friend is Dr. Michael Weber of the Weber Energy Institute and is an energy expert, and he just wrote another book called Power Trip, and it's been on my bedside table for uh, more than a few months now, so I've got to get that book read. <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll let Michael Weber know that it's next, right after General Colin Powell, who we had the good fortune, uh, Tammy, of having serve on our board of directors for nearly uh -huh. two decades. What an wow. amazing, amazing human being. Uh, uh, First Lady Murphy, book on your nightstand. Uh, one of my favorite um, writers is somebody named Frank Bruni. And he recently released a book called The Beauty of Dusk, which, which I am plowing through right now. Um, not, not a difficult read, but, but well-written. And uh, that's what I'm reading right now. Oh, right, yeah. Good. <laughs> if, if I may share, I'm reading, I'm not sure you can see it, Speed and Scale by a longtime uh, former board member of Bloom Energy, John Doerr, the venture capitalist, uh, about our climate crisis and steps that we can be taking right now. And it's a fascinating book. I'm no longer allowed to eat what I used to eat when I just found out the climate impact. And there's there's a whole section, Sherilyn, and on Antarctica in what you were talking about earlier as well. Second lightning round question to First Lady Tammy Murphy. If someone is visiting you from out of the state of New Jersey, what are the top three places in New Jersey you want to take them? That's really tough to ask. You're going to make me as the first lady of New Jersey pick three. Um, I, I guess what I would say is uh, the Jersey Shore, of course. Um, and and in the, on the Jersey Shore, Island Beach State Park is, is my favorite. Um, and then I would say probably um, the Pine Barrens, maybe. And then the Governor's Mansion, because I've been renovating it. And I, I uh, think it's a pretty cool place. Well, Sherilyn, I think we need to go out and visit. I, I was just going to say, can I come visit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sherilyn Moore, how about you? You can do your former state of Washington or your adopted state of California. Three places that you oh. would take someone. 
Well, that's that's wonderful. So I, I, I will mix and match. Uh, up in the beautiful area of Spokane, Washington is right across the border from Idaho. And the most beautiful lake in the country is Coeur d'Alene Lake. And there's a floating green at the Coeur d'Alene Golf Resort that is spectacular. So that would be um, a key highlight uh, for anyone that hasn't been up in that, that area. Uh, here, what we love to do is we're getting so many guests now that we've moved to the sunny state of California. And so one of the first things we do is we go to a Giants game because we've adopted the San Francisco Giants and we love to do that. And the other thing that we love to do is go to Carmel by the sea. Uh, and um, of course, Pebble Beach uh, Golf Club is right near there as well. So those are a few highlights, but there's so much more we need to explore here. So I'll explain my list if I were to do this again, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Sherilyn, I'm coming back to you. Where have you always wanted to travel, but have not yet had the chance to visit? Well, I, I really want to go to Santorini, Greece. Um, ah. That is, I've got my eye on that. And then I've also always wanted to go to, to Bali and be in one of those huts that are on the water. So depending on my mood, one or the other, someday. Those huts need solid oxide fuel cells. I, I see a business trip in the making. I think they do. I think they, they do. do. They do. First Lady Tammy Murphy, where haven't you been that you'd still like to go? Uh, I would really, really like to go to Bhutan. And I would also really like to go to Machu Picchu. Mm. Uh, I was going to say Gesundheit, but that's a little old on the Machu Picchu. Let me move on quickly. <laughs> what is the best advice, Tammy Murphy, that you have ever been given and by whom? Uh, absolutely by my mother, who absolutely always told me I could do anything and to never let anyone else tell me otherwise. Well said, Mom. Sherilyn Moore. Oh, you know what? That was my dad. So you inspired me, but I won't, but I'll, I'll, I, I, I will. Um, that was a good one. Uh, from a work standpoint to go a different direction, the best advice I had was a leader that I worked for, Mr. Doug Staker. He said, Sherilyn, there's a moment in time where there's, a, all, there's an analysis that you could keep doing and then you just make a decision. Most of the time, you're better off making the decision and go. And if you need to retract, you're better off than you are not making the decision in the first place. And I think he said it more eloquently than that, but you get the idea. Yeah, good. And Sherilyn, your vocal cords are warm. We're coming right back to you. We went from best advice to pet peeve. Do you have a pet peeve? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm laughing because it's not my biggest pet peeve, but just yesterday I received, if my team was on the line, I received a slide where everything is one static picture. So you can't move things around and jokingly I yell, I'm like, don't ever do that to me. I can't edit it. Like, That's my biggest work pet peeve. So as a joke, um, I, I just saw my, one of my team, it wasn't me, Sherilyn. So that was, um. And a little bit of jokingness. That was a, a work thing just yesterday. Oh, that's great. Uh, Tammy Murphy? Okay, so this is brutally honest. And uh, it, it, my whole family <laughs>, laughs at me, but I think I've now managed to, to get them all on board with this notion. I can't stand it when people put luggage on beds. If, it, <laughs> if you think about where that luggage has been and what it's been pulled through and the oil slicks that has gone through on the streets, backs of taxis, God knows, um, I, I, it's a real thing for me. <laughs> don't put luggage on my bed. <laughs> I don't like unpacked luggage. When I check into a hotel, I immediately unpack my luggage and put it away. When I get home, I immediately unpack and put it away. Not as good as yours, but uh, but I wanted so mine's to. Mine's more neurotic. Yours is probably <laughs> more intelligent. Mine's just neurotic, but you asked, so I told you. <laughs> oh, that's great, First Lady Murphy. Outside of a family member, who's the most influential person in your life? Uh, that that's a pretty easy one. It, it's got to be Al Gore. Ah. I mean, he's he's because of him, I've I've uh, done a lot over the last you know, more than a quarter of a century. I've, I've moved things. I've tried to change the way we live. I've, you know, tried to implement things. And, and I have a challenge for you guys at the end of this when we're, when we're all finished. 
Oh, good. Boy, I'm glad you've, you've whet our appetites with that. <laughs> Sherilyn Moore, how about you? Outside of a family member, the most influential person in your life. <laughs> That's a tough one, right? Because we're influenced in so many aspects of our life. I, I have to say, I love myself some Oprah. So the amount of, uh, you know, thoughts, books, ideas, inspiration, ideas over the years that I took away from Oprah are pretty, uh, pretty large. But I love. There's a lot of other people I could list. Thank you. And I want to remind our Bloom Energy colleagues, please start loading up our chat box with your questions or send them to Jennifer Dufour. But go ahead and start placing your questions for our third segment in just a couple of moments. Sherilyn, coming back to you, uh, if you could have any talent that you do not already have, what would it be? Oh, my goodness. If I could carry a tune, I would... <laughs> <laughs> what I wouldn't do, you can hear my voice right now. This girl doesn't have a musical inclination or body. And in fact, I did the 23 and Me. And one of my characteristics from my DNA is that I'm un very unlikely to be musically inclined. So there's very little I can do with it. They can tell that from a characteristic in your DNA. I was shocked, but yes, said okay. it very unlikely. There you go. To carry First, it to. First Lady Tammy Murphy. So, um, I have to say, Sherilyn and I must share the same DNA. I think that would be exactly what I would say, assuming it's not, you know, discovering a miracle cure for some <laughs> affliction. Um, I, I probably would have said, you know, a, carrying a tune, uh, maybe maybe dancing really well, or um, mm -hmm. yeah, something along those lines. Or what about just that the the people that can do that really loud whistle? Yeah, really, that's. Good. I greatly admire that too. <laughs> I love those. Uh, so I cannot carry a tune either, not a chance, uh, but our middle daughter was uh, had the good fortune of being adopted. So she did not inherit my inability to have any musical gift. And she is doing the solo at school this Friday night singing On My Own from Les Miserables. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. At, at 12 years old and just wow. nails it. So wow. uh, her good fortune was not having my DNA. It's the lesson there. Our final lightning round question. And we're going to start with First Lady Tammy Murphy. A quote or a saying that inspires you? So um, it's got to be. Wayne Gretzky's quote, which is truly our family motto, uh, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Ah, such a great quote. I like his other quote too. You skate to where the puck is going, not to where it has been. It's been, yep, yes, exactly. Yes. Sherilyn Moore. I just completely lost any quoting ability of an amazing quote, but I love the ones around how many times you fail before you win. And I think that's greatly inspirational. And I am known to say it is what it is a lot as a proxy for, you know, sometimes we just need to not over, over stress, over worry and let things be a little bit. We have some great questions that are coming in. We're going to get to as many as we can while still keeping everyone on time. Uh, the first question, what are some ways we can include the many diverse communities within our states in the energy transition? Who would like to take that? Um, well, I'm probably the least likely one, but I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a shot at it. Um, one thing I'm, I'm running, so I've been the chair of something called the Green Council here in New Jersey. Uh, we are working to come up with a plan that will effectively give my husband a roadmap uh, going forward as to how we can effectively get to a completely green economy by the year 2050. And, and importantly, we've been trying to tackle a lot of the questions about um, social justice, environmental justice, and how do you how do you define what a green job is? Um, and and as part of that, you know, we have been really looking um, to uh, people who are not only um, incarcerated but also people who are living in these terrible areas where there's tremendous um, air pollution, as you were just talking about earlier, and trying to help understand how we can 
change policy and change the way we approach uh, some of the um, some of the things that we do on an everyday basis and and really um, incorporate the challenges that are facing those communities. And we've we've interviewed these people. We've gone on tours to look at some of the blight and make sure that we all deeply understand how um, our actions are impacting everyday people. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a lot of ways, but I think it's really talking to people is the bottom line. Yeah, I, I, Tammy, you're exactly right, right about that. It's educate, educate, educate. I don't, I really do. And Carl, we were talking about this just this morning, um, weren't we? Where, you know, how do we get our message across and how is it that people still have, you know, misperceptions that um, get in the way from a policy so that talking to people and educating, it is, you know, for us as a company, we, we do have our eye on an end prize, which is how can we create clean, resilient, affordable energy for everyone in the world? And what that means is we have to stay focused on how we bring our costs down so that we can, you know, continually make our solutions more and more accessible to more people. And we really are on that mission. And ultimately, it is um, also, you know, we have to do you know, keep, you know, keep working across a partner ecosystem to also enable, you know, what it is we see, which are our choices, education, and, you know, bringing more solutions to bear that people don't even realize exist. Well said, well said. I want to get to at least one more question, hopefully two. Uh, this, were, this one from Virginia Citrano. Uh, First Lady Tammy Murphy, beyond climate change and maternal health, you've been an advocate for mental health and suicide prevention. What can other states learn from New Jersey's work in this area and what remains to be done? So much remains to be done. I mean, it's been really, uh, obviously the pandemic has um, underscored not only the environmental and social injustices across our country, but because people have been so isolated, the mental health needs are, are just so dramatic right now. Um, I, I, would, I would say that we have, we have a long way to go. It's gonna cost a lot of money and there's gonna have to be a lot of patience. Um, but I, you know, since you've, since you've asked that one question, one thing I did wanna say, which is um, akin to it, I think almost, and that is the challenge that I was gonna put at your feet, um, given, given where you are located and given what you all do. Um, we are the first state in the United States to incorporate climate change into our K-12 curriculum across all standards of the curriculum. And uh, my, I, I, I had to really push for this. And the, the reason I wanted to do that is I think that our children and, and, and those who follow need to understand the vocabulary. They need to understand the challenges that we are creating in our world right now. And if they don't have the basic understanding across all areas, you know, whether they become uh, an engineer or an artist or, you know, someone who's in communications, they, this is um, an area that is the future. And, and we all um, must make sure that, that our kids are equipped with the tools that they are going to need to come up with the solutions down the road. So um, my challenge is come on Bloom, get on, get on California and, and make sure that you guys are the uh, second, second state in the United States because we can't do it on our own. Can I what? get what a, what a great bit of advice. Thank you. And, and I'm glad that issue of mental health came up because we saw how mm -hmm. this tw 27 months into a pandemic mm -hmm. is impacting so many people uh, and, and the impact even of shelter in place, which is so important on so many levels, but so devastating. Uh, especially among kids. It, one of the many things that I'm proud about uh, with Bloom Energy is that our uh, healthcare package is not only amazingly generous on medical, dental, and visual, but also uh, mental health and financial health as well. Uh, I'm going to try to slip in one more quick question. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Oh, it's just a comment from Nirupama. Uh, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So thank you for all of this that you are doing. We uh, want to honor everyone's time. I'm so glad that you let us know that there was going to be a challenge at the end that you wet our <laughs> appetites with. I must say, from the moment that I met you at the National Governors Association Conference, I was so inspired by your leadership and your vision and the way that you reach out to people that we just had to include you 
for one of our Bloom Energy Empowered Communities employee town halls. What we try to do, though, is we try to hear from members of our team and stakeholders in our work of what nuggets did they hear that they're going to take away from today's conversation. So I'd like to welcome uh, two of those people for about 60 seconds each or up to 60 seconds each. The first is Chelsea Charles Menezes, uh, uh, and the second is Michael Mushadi. Uh, with Chelsea, Bloom is proud to have an over a decade long partnership with a company called AirTac USA, a New Jersey based supplier of high efficiency blowers and other equipment that are key pieces of Bloom Energy's fuel cell and electrolyzer products. AirTech has 103 employees in New Jersey, 42 of whom are dedicated to producing leading edge products for Bloom Energy. So I'd like to invite Chelsea Menezes, a design engineer at AirTech, uh, in 60 seconds to share her key takeaways. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Chelsea Menezes, and as Carl said, I'm a designer working at AirTech. Um, as someone who's just starting out my professional career, I think listening to the experiences of Sheridan Mo and First Lady T Murphy were really inspiring to me and something that I will definitely take forward. Um, AirTech, we are a manufacturer in Northern New Jersey and we have an extremely diverse uh, workplace. And we also are very proud of the fact that historically nearly at least half of our engineering team comprised of women. And um, listening to your stories earlier was really uh, amazing. Along with that, um, AirTech produces key equipment, as Carl mentioned, for the Bloom Energy fuel cells. And I'm really happy to be working at the company that is has such a great work environment and is uh, helping flight uh, climate change. Where are you located? Uh, we are located in Rutherford, Rutherford, New Rutherford. Jersey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Chelsea. You can, come, you can come to the governor's mansion. <laughs> <laughs> Any day. Just call me. I'll be there. <laughs> okay, Carl will help us. Chelsea, thanks for sharing some of your nuggets from today's conversation with us. Michael Mushadi, if you could take yourself off of mute. Hi, good afternoon, First Lady Murphy. I, I would just say that your comment about every American should travel abroad, that really resonated with me. Um, you know, my mother came here when she was 17. My dad's parents landed at Ellis Island. And when we were being spoiled brats growing up, they would always say, you don't know how good you have it living here. <laughs> and uh, 20 years ago, when I first started traveling abroad on business, it really hit home. So um, that definitely resonated with me. And now it's funny, uh, as I travel to different states across the country, uh, my children and myself also find ourselves um, longing to get back to New Jersey, depending on where we are. So um, with that, as a 10-year resident of New Jersey, thank you for all of your work making New Jersey an inclusive state with equal employment, educational, and health care opportunities for everybody. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Michael, where are you? I live in Scotch Plains, New Jersey. I love this. Well, it's nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you for that. You awesome also can come to the governor's mansion. Very easy for you. <laughs> Michael, thank you so much for the work you do as a strategic account executive and the leadership you show in so many aspects of your professional and personal life. I want to remind all of our Bloom Energy colleagues, we have another opportunity, one of many, to give back to our communities. Independence Day weekend, Saturday, July 2nd, for our second annual Bloom Energy Stars and Strides Community Run and Walk. Last year, in, in a pandemic, in our inaugural year, we were able to raise and donate $274,500 for our public hospitals and public health care clinics and the million patients they serve annually throughout Silicon Valley. Our ambitious goal with all of us participating this year is $350,000. So please sign up show up and stand up for those who are less fortunate than us at starsandstridesrun.com. 
because Cheryl and Moore's team is pretty much completely registered and we're all trying to catch up to them. So again, That's stars like a and competition to bring me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Starsandstridesrun.com. I want to thank again Cheryl and Moore, our chief marketing officer and, ex and executive vice president. And what an honor it is to have the first lady of the Garden State, the state of New Jersey, Tammy Murphy, as our honored guest. Thanks for the amazing and inspiring and effective work that you are doing each and every day with your team. Thank you, Carl. And thanks, Sherilyn. It was it, it was fun. It was a nice it was a nice change of pace for me. So thank you. It was good. <laughs> thank you. And if I look at my clock right, it is 1 p.m. at Bloom Energy. We start on time, we end on time, and we respect your time. So thank you all for participating. We will see you for our next employee town hall. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks.